Since 2004, Iowa livestock farmers have turned to the coalition to support Iowa's farmers for free, confidential, and expert assistance in raising livestock responsibly and successfully. Join us at the fence line to hear from industry experts and farmers about topics important to livestock agriculture here in Iowa. The fence line, where the gates always open. Welcome to The Fence Line. The Fence Line is a podcast produced by the Coalition to Support Iowa's Farmers. My name is Bob Quinn, and today we're going to investigate the partnership that livestock producers have with crop production, in particular corn growers here in the state of Iowa, adding profit back to both products. A lot of times that means a product that is derived from corn that is used to feed livestock. And we're talking about ethanol and we're talking about DDGs today. We're also going to talk about uh, an announcement for further sales of E15 here in the state of Iowa. We're talking with uh, Rebecca Aronson, first of all today. She is market development manager with the Iowa Corn Growers. Rebecca was with me on a recent edition of The Big Show. Rebecca and I happen to be sitting in the main offices of Homeland Energy Solutions, a 200 million gallon a year ethanol producer in Lawler, Iowa. It was a windy day that day, and right outside the window, a few of the 200 plus corn trucks were going by unloading their loads into that ethanol plant and we could see the steam blowing uh, pretty stout off of the stacks as ethanol is being produced ddgs being produced corn oil being produced as well in this plant when we think of ethanol we think of fuel so let's talk fuel announcements with rebecca And we're going to find out more about the ethanol industry. We have a couple of big announcements coming out uh, today. In fact, one we just learned about here about 10 minutes ago. And Rebecca, we're going to talk ethanol, all things ethanol, and uh, adding value back into corn through ethanol production, through uh, livestock uh, as well, because things that come out of an ethanol plant, livestock feed. So we're going to talk about that. But the elephant in the room right now is a uh, announcement uh, that E15 will be available uh, here in the Midwest this year. People say, well, what's the big deal? It's available now. Well, EPA rules state that really E15 can't be sold in the summer in the Midwest. So that, that's yeah. that's a big deal. Here's, here's the time to, to brag it up. So E15 yeah. announcement now available across eight states in the Midwest uh, now, uh, continuously it looks like. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having us here today, Bob. We are super excited about this announcement today. Like you said, it's previously been stated that we can't have E15 sold um, throughout the summer, but this really expands our market for corn demand to drive that corn grind, um, and we're super excited, not only as Iowa corn growers, but just farmers in general. It's a huge win for the state of Iowa today, but also the U.S. If you've been following along with the story, you know that the EPA has approved E15 sales through the summer, but not this summer. Yep. They had approved it, and it can go into effect next year. Right. So Iowa corn growers, corn growers all across the country are saying, well, wait a second. If we're selling it now and we can sell it a year from now, why can't we sell it this summer? Right. EPA is in a rulemaking process. It takes some time. So uh, the waiver has been announced now that uh, E15 will be uh, available. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. And when I go to the pump, I don't look so much at E15, uh, E85. So I look at the price. Yes. Yes. And uh, to me, fuel, is, and, and maybe this isn't uh, what the fuel industry likes to hear, but to me, fuel is a price-driven commodity. Mm -hmm. So I buy what yep. is cheapest yep. <laughs> there and, and available. Yes, and typically that unleaded 88, that E15, that'll be the cheapest and not only supporting your pocket, but also the farmers across the state. And I think also to point out, we're sitting on a huge pile of carryover corn that this will just continue to expand and, and drive that market. So our farmers will be able to push that corn demand 
demand uh, to be made into ethanol and further go on to our gas supply this summer. Well, what the uh, Corn Promotion Board does so well is find uses for corn. Producers do a wonderful job producing it here in the state of Iowa, and uh, we have ethanol. We're at an ethanol plant right now, yes. so this is kind of uh, where things come in as a kernel and go out as many products. Yep. Uh, and one of them is ethanol. Yep. Another, though, is DDGs, which goes yes. into the livestock industry, and I think uh, livestock might be the number two user of Iowa corn. Mm-hmm. Yes. So it's really important not only the CSIF folks in the room having their partnership, but also our state partners with Iowa Cattlemen's Association, Iowa Pork. Um, we really partner with them not only throughout the year with events and um, just driving that that farmer story, but also um, recognizing that our Iowa corn growers that are a part of our boards and committees, they are also diversified livestock farmers. So making sure they have a voice in our committee meetings and also know that their product that goes to an ethanol plant is also being um, made into DDGs to feed their cattle, pork, poultry. We know we're number one in a lot of those categories, so not only corn, which makes it super exciting to be an Iowa farmer. Well, it is uh, a wonderful operation we're looking at here. We're in Lawler, Iowa, and uh, according to their, their publications, they're uh, about a 200 million gallon a year ethanol plant, which means they're grinding somewhere uh, north of 65 million bushels of corn, so yep. they're a big user here, and they turn that into ethanol, turn it into uh, DDGs uh, as well, and many other products. We're going to be talking with the uh, CEO coming up here a little yes. bit and maybe pull the curtain back <laughs> and see what else comes out of this plant. Rebecca? Rebecca Aronson, uh, Iowa Corn, Iowa Corn Promotion Board, visiting with us. Uh, we mentioned we're talking to the CEO of Homeland Energy Solutions. Let's catch up with Telly Papasamakis. I am at the Homeland Energy Solutions plant in Lawler, Iowa, and uh, we are uh, watching uh, corn in and uh, byproducts out, including ethanol and uh, DDGs, and CEO of the plant here, Telly Papasimakis. Telly, did I get, get close in there? You did very, very well uh, for you and your listeners. Telly Savalas, if they understand or like Kojak, that will work too. <laughs> Telly was offering to sign autographs here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, tell you, Papa Samakis, uh, you're at the uh, uh, Lawler plant here. Now, this uh, uh, your, your publication says that you're a 200 million gallon a year ethanol plant. Yes, we're a little over that, but yes, that's a good boiler plate. Uh, so, how, how does that rank amongst ethanol plants? Are big, big size. Yes, we are probably, I would say, in the top two or three percent. Um, and I would have us today, as in terms of dry mills, probably uh, the four largest in the country. So coming in, you're taking in corn from how, how big an area? Uh, I would say uh, about a 100-mile radius. 100-mile radius of the plant. You bring corn in. And we've had a steady flow of trucks coming yes. through here today. Yes. On, on a typical day, wh wh what do you get for truck traffic? Well, uh, it's a lot of trucks if you think about it. Uh, not a lot of bushels per truck, right? It's 1,000. So to get to our number, we have to have close to 200 trucks a day. 200 trucks a day coming in here. Generally speaking, corn growers get a uh, economic bump. I mean, we look at basis all the time, right? Yes. And and when you when you sell a lot of contracts, you figure basis is, is, is how you figure your profit in in uh, in their added value. What what kind of a, a basis are you using? So that's a very good question, and and to not try to overcomplicate it, but I've been in the industry for 25 years, and through these 25 plus years, I've seen the advent of the ethanol industry coming in and really trans transforming our uh, agricultural landscape uh, because ethanol came in and created newfound demand uh, for agriculture, which raised or lifted all boats. For Homeland specifically, just to give you a stat, we have paid old farmers over $4 billion of cash for corn since our inception. And uh, that translates roughly to about $28,000 an hour of value add that we've created for farmers in $28,000 an hour. An hour. You know, w when you talk about uh, value and adding value, that, that's exactly what we're, what we're looking for. So you, you've got ethanol coming out. And, and where does your ethanol go from here? So our ethanol is going to be transported um, primarily to big transportation hubs. Uh, basically, where a lot of people are driving, there's a lot of cars. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, the Chicago market and the New York market is where a lot of our ethanol ends up at. Uh, coming out of an ethanol plant, generally speaking, you get three products. You get ethanol. And I know you get a lot of other ones uh, as well, but then we're talking DDGs, okay, and, and we're talking CO2 uh, coming out as well. Your, your DDGs, uh, it's a dry product leaving here, so you must dry it. Yes, so it's, it's uh, a dry product that we're making. Uh, it's uh, now a standard within the industry. At some point, the DDG market had to be developed as more and more ethanol plants came into the fold. But today, we, we make over 11 cars a day of DDGs uh, production-wise that then are going to get grouped and shipped as unit cars or unit trains to the destinations we talked about. And, and where, do, generally speaking, does that do the DDGs go out of here? So they get loaded uh, here. We have a a relationship with the railroad, and they get transported, you know, anywhere from um, at some point in the west, the south, and it's as far south as uh, Mexico and as far north as Canada. Well, it's no secret. I mean, the the DDGs get shipped all over the country. We we serve stations and have stations in California that end up with Iowa DDGs. There's places in Texas, so it 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 doesn't just necessarily stay here in the uh, in, in the Midwest. But uh, economic impact of this plant has got to be phenomenal here in, in this section of Iowa. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I think in addition, in addition to um, uh, the four billion dollars of over four billion dollars of revenue created for farmers, uh, you have to understand that not only is that revenue stay in Iowa, but then the derivative of that revenue, the products that we create, get consumed by folks outside of our state. So we are bringing essentially revenue into Iowa by having us take those products and sell them into Texas and California and Canada and Mexico. So the, the, the impact is, is great. So in addition to that, I mean, we're looking at having um, – uh, realized almost a billion dollars worth of revenue uh, uh, created by our DDGs. Uh, there's substantial corn oil revenue, as we are a leader in the manufacturing of corn oil as well as a single site. Uh, the wages and the benefits created for local employment. Uh, this plant has created over $80 million worth of wages and benefits for employees over 15 years. And, of course, uh, distributions to our members, our owners. The other thing that it does, too, and is it, is it smooths that delivery process for farmers. It allows them to store grain on their farm. And I'm looking out the window at a, a giant uh, sook-up grain bin, and you, you don't see how big these things are until I know how big that sign is there, and it looks like a tiny little sign stuck on a grain bin. How big is that bin? Two million bushel. That's a two million bushel bin. So if, if you parked a pickup truck next to it, you wouldn't hardly see the pickup truck. Uh, so d- just to know the, the scale that we're talking with. We're talking Farming for Your Future Friday. Adding value to corn, and something we do very well here in the state of Iowa, is produce corn, and something the Iowa Corn Promotion Board does very well is add value back into that product. We're being hosted uh, Farming for Your Future Friday by the Coalition Support Iowa's uh, Farmers. Cody Havens is with us right now. Uh, Cody, you uh, get a chance to visit uh, a lot of livestock operations here in the state of Iowa, and it's uh, no secret, well, maybe it is to some folks, but uh, livestock are big consumers of corn. Yes, yeah. I mean, it is. It, it's a big deal. It's a natural market for it here, and uh, so there's a, a natural uh, tie-in there with uh, uh, adding value back into that bushel of corn through uh, through livestock. We used to talk about walking the corn to market. In other words, we'd put it in hogs uh, back then, and uh, that was the uh, mortgage lifter on the farm was hog production, <laughs> and uh, we'd walk that bushel of corn into market then and be worth a lot more. So livestock is a wonderful way to enhance the value. Of, uh, of uh, corn. You work up uh, in this section of the state? You have some folks you, you work with? Yeah, yeah. I, I cover the entire uh, state of Iowa. I've been up north here quite a few times. Uh, have kind of a beaten path there on I-80 over and then up. So, uh, yeah, I kind of cover the entire area, um, visiting livestock producers that are wanting to build new or expand their existing operations. Mostly uh, cattle country here? Uh, yeah, right now it seems like uh, getting a lot of cattle calls, and that's kind of what we're doing. Um, but, yeah, all over the state. I passed, uh, I passed a handful of uh, hog barns on my way up to. 
Do, have you heard anything from the dairy industry lately? Oh, yeah. We've been getting a lot of calls. A lot of reta- uh, retaining ownership of the feeder calves is kind of the big deal right now with cattle prices and the way that, that they are. And so, yeah, um, we've got a ton of calls in the dairy operation. And then while I'm there, you know, we also talk about um, their future and maybe uh, uh, expanding their, their parlor, their milking parlor, and their um, so that way they can grow the dairy operation. You know, we hear a lot about the uh, one of the products coming out of there is the uh, what dairy on beef, I guess. So we're seeing some of these uh, dairy cattle actually end up in the feedlot. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's really a driving force behind um, some of these uh, these calls that I have wanting to put up uh, confinement barns so that way they can put the beef under a roof and be as efficient as possible. And, and they're really just kind of looking forward to bringing the next generation back and, and looking for a way to, to build some revenue and, and go about that. What about uh, uh, calving barns? Because uh, that's uh, about the time of the year when uh, you usually get mud all over the place. And uh, I've heard a few uh, uh, fellas talking about, boy, it'd be nice to be able to calve indoors. Oh, absolutely. That, that That's definitely a hot topic now uh, in this, this time of the year, um, going out and, and citing those in. You know, there's rules and regulations that come with any confinement operation. So, uh, yeah, we go out and talk to those guys. And, and, it, and really, the, the confinement, um, it's still a confinement, and you build it kind of the same, the design just a little bit different and kind of head counts. So I'm um, talking through the interior designs and also just what uh, rules and regulations go with that and, and talking about uh, money that's available, too, to partner um, uh, with the producer on making it a little bit more affordable. So when folks call uh, the coalition, what, what are some of the things they, they need to be able to tell you? Um, honestly, just kind of what, what their goal is and what they want to build and then um, kind of paint the picture for me on what they have for animal unit numbers and, and really just how many head they have and, and species count together, but uh, the the way you house them could potentially count separately. So as long as you know how many uh, animals you have and, and where you want to go with it, we can do the animal unit math and, and really just kind of build and build it from there. So how can we find out more about the coalition? Uh, you can always uh, visit our website, supportfarmers.com. Got a lot of great information on there. Or you can give, a call, give us a call at 1-800-932-2436. Cody Havens with the Coalition to Support Iowa's Farmers. Again, the livestock folks here and the host and producer of the fence line the podcast you're listening to right now well let's get back and talk corn growers and livestock producers forming a partnership and some of the byproducts that benefit uh, both we're talking right now with chris edgington past national corn grower association president and we're going to start off with an announcement that e15 will now be available throughout the summer and uh, that is a big deal. It's been uh, waited on by corn growers uh, er- ever since we found out that E15 would be available next year. And the question was, okay, what about this summer? You know, it's a great thing that it's available, Bob, because the last two summers we have proven that E15 both is a safe, reliable, but it's also lower cost, and it's helping the consumers at the pump, anywhere from 15 to $0.30, cents depending upon their market. And so it's a win for everybody, and every vehicle since 2001 has been approved to run E15 in their engines. And so it's always been a little bit of a frustration that we just simply can't get it year-round right off the bat. It's been tested as much as any fuel you've ever seen on the market. But it's a great announcement today. Well, we certainly are celebrating that, uh, Chris. And uh, I want to get back on uh, uh, task here now. We want to talk about the uh, connection between uh, livestock uh, industry and uh, corn. And, uh, you know, we're we're an ethanol plant. We know that's the number one user of corn is uh, ethanol. But number two is uh, livestock. So let's talk about that connection between corn growers and the livestock industry. It's a great connection, and it has been forever. You know, and actually, corn is, is uh, livestock's probably number one, because when you add in the distiller's grains, as well as the whole grain um, that livestock eat, whether it's poultry, beef, pork, turkey, um, they consume a lot of corn. And we have a great relationship uh, with the livestock industry from the corn standpoint. Um, and we continue to encourage uh, that development as they work on their rations. Um, corn and corn products, byproducts out of the ethanol industry, have proven time and time again to be the most effective, efficient way for a livestock person to finish out their product. 
Well, and Chris, you know, you, you talk about uh, worldwide uh, use of something we grow right here in the state of Iowa, and uh, we were talking with uh, Telly here a little bit ago, and the DDGs uh, that come out of this plant, and we're talking about a plant in Lawler, Iowa, okay, uh, the DDG product will make its way not only all across the U.S., but uh, they're sending DDGs uh, that's uh, produced in Iowa fields uh, up through uh, Canada and also uh, down through Mexico as well. Yeah, and not only those markets, but also into Southeast Asia. Um, and, and they love the product because it's a 10 11% moisture, very stable, um, and it can be shipped in a container. It can be shipped in a, in a large boat. It can go on rail. And so it fits a lot of places, and they can get it in, and they don't worry about it going out of condition in some hot, humid climates, whether you're in Mexico or they don't have a lot of hot and humid in Canada very often. But, you know, Southeast Asia and Mexico certainly do, and, and it's, it's just a great product for them. Well, we certainly appreciate uh, what uh, you guys do so well, and that is uh, promote corn. We grow it here and uh, need to find an outlet for it, need to find uses for it, and that's what the Iowa Corn Promotion Board does. Chris Edgington, past National Corn Grower Association president. Well, as I mentioned before, we are sitting in the offices of the Homeland Energy Solutions Ethanol Plant in Lawler, Iowa, and they produce about 200 million gallons of ethanol each year, also a lot Lot of DDGs. I want to talk now a little bit more about the plant and the benefits to the surrounding area. Talking right now with uh, Zach Nosbish, and uh, Zach is with uh, the folks here at uh, Homeland Energy Solutions. So, Zach, it says you're the uh, commodity risk manager. I'm guessing you have uh, something to do with uh, buying uh, grain then. I do, Bob. Yeah, it, uh, each and every day, you know, um, we're grinding through a couple hundred, a uh, couple hundred trucks a day. So, um, yeah, so our our department's responsible for uh, making sure those trucks are lined up, uh, ready to come in each and every day. And, and again, how many trucks do you go through? Say a couple hundred a day? Yep. Yep, about 200 trucks a day. So uh, we did put in a project here a couple years ago. Uh, we added another couple scales. So we got two inbound scales, two outbound scales. Um, we can dump trucks at, you know, 60 trucks an hour. Um, I think some of our bigger days uh, we'll have during harvest are upwards of 500 trucks in a day. How about that? And, wow. uh, yeah, so uh, had, you know, a lot of success with that. I know the guys really love it and, you know, four to 500 trucks a day and turning um, you know, 10 to 11 minutes scale to scale. So something we're really proud of and, you know, something we, we work on each and every day because, like you said, you know, we know it's important for the guys to get that crop out, get it out timely, and, uh, yeah, something we're always uh, always working on. So, what, what moisture corn do you look for when you're coming in? Um, you know, that, uh, that 15 and a half is kind of uh, where we like to see it, but obviously, you know, we take it higher than that. But, uh, but throughout the year, I would say it averages right around on that, you know, 15 and a half to so. And, and you turn that uh, corn that comes in into lots of products right here on site. Lots of products, yep. We know ethanol. Yep. We've, we've talked a little bit about that. We know DDG is coming out of here as well. Uh, I was asking you, what, you got some train cars uh, out here that are tanker cars, and you said you uh, take uh, about a tanker load of, of uh, what, corn oil out as well? Yep. We make uh, about one rail car a day of uh, corn oil. You know, like we talked earlier, we were uh, we were kind of early, early adopters of the, the corn oil to rail car direct uh you know a lot of the early plants that put corn oil was truck only and uh we we elected here at homeland to to put a rail load out which you know has proved to be really uh really positive for the company as we were early suppliers down into that renewable diesel market uh diamond green down in norco so you, you said corn oil and renewable diesel so most of the oil going to that diesel product here yeah, a lot of our corn oil is supplied into the renewable diesel market. How about that? Uh, I, I want to ask you a little bit about the volume of corn throughout the year then. Uh, this is a huge uh, uh, user of, of corn. So wh where do the products go after they leave here? I would say, you know, 99% of our ethanol leaves via rail. So, you know, we're making just shy of, or loading, making uh, about 2.9 million gallons every four and a half days. And most of that, 
because we're on the CP rail line, is ending up in the, the East Coast market, the New York Harbor market. So that's where a lot of our ethanol ends up. Uh, from a distiller's perspective, uh, a lot of that uh, is actually heading down to Mexico. Um, we, we, uh, we deliver roughly you know, a couple unit trains down to Mexico uh, a month. We do, we do hit the West Coast occasionally. Uh, and then that other third that, you know, that we're producing on a monthly basis, you know, works into our local uh, feeder market as well. So obviously we feed a lot of hogs in the area. So um, a lot of feed mills coming in for DDGs via truck every day. So what, what, uh, what kind of car hauls that uh, train car hauls your, your DDGs? They're a little bit bigger car than your traditional corn hopper, uh, but okay. um, so yeah. it's a dried product then. It is a dried product. You must yeah. have a dryer on site then. Yeah. So in the process, we've got uh, actually three sets of dryers. So yeah, we're we're drying it depending on the time of year. You know, anywhere from that ten to twelve percent moisture. Off the top of your head, what what other products come out of this this plant? Well, during the COVID days. Um, you know, we also elected uh, to put a project in that we also make a little bit of industrial ethanol. Um, that's something that we also produce on site. So we produce into some other markets there that are used into some of the home care stuff, uh, laundry. Uh, so, you know, that was a way for us, you know, everybody through the COVID years. Uh, a, a look for a disinfectant type product? Uh, uh, yeah, it actually goes into their, uh, oh, I believe it's into the Tide Pods. No uh, kidding. Yeah. Yeah, so so that was another way for for our company to say, hey, you know, we know the world's changing on us a little bit here. So what are what are other I'm things that, that you know we can do value added here with the kernel of corn that's produced, you know, in our local counties and 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 add to the bottom line. That's so. an amazing product. Hey Zach, thanks for talking to us uh, a little bit. Zach Nosbish, commodity risk manager, Homeland Energy Solutions. How about that? Iowa-grown corn has a role in Tide laundry pods, among many other things. Well, friends, today we've been talking about the partnership between Iowa's Corn Growers Corn Promotion Board and the livestock industry and the ethanol industry. Big thank you to the Iowa Corn Growers for participating, the Iowa Corn Promotion Board, Homeland Energy Solutions as well for hosting us during the podcast today. The Fence Line podcast is produced by the Coalition to Support Iowa's Farmers. The livestock folks here in the state of Iowa, you can find out more at supportfarmers.com. Bob Quinn here, and I'll be talking to you again real soon on The Fence Line.